Recording starts. Great. So hi, Heidi. Thank you very much for taking the time for the interview today. I am very excited to be talking to you. My pleasure, Diane. I'm excited to be talking to you too. That's great. And just for our, um, just for our audience, I wanted to introduce you. Okay. So um, I am Diane Lee, a student at Stanford University. And today I'm talking with Heidi, who is an incredible Silicon Valley entrepreneur. Three years after she graduated from Stanford with a degree in creative writing, she started her own software company called TeaMaker, a company that um, created personal computing software. And after her company was very successful and was acquired, Heidi went to work at Apple, where she was vice president of um, worldwide developer relations. And after that, she served on the board of many companies, including TiVo. And lately, she um, created Skinny Songs, which is a bunch of radio hit quality songs to help people meet their weight loss goals. Right. So um, Skinny Songs has done really well as well. It's been on Oprah. It's been on CNN as well as the Martha Stewart show. And um, all of these things just don't even cover everything that Heidi has done. So um, you've definitely taken the path less traveled. And I think, you know, after graduating from Stanford with a degree in creative writing, anyone would have said, you know, you know, you want to do what? Start a software company? Yeah. And I think <laughs> I'm just curious um, that if you hadn't taken the path less traveled, what sort of work or career do you think you would have done? And but more importantly, um, how did you find your North Star and, you know, what you truly want to do with your life? And how would you advise young people who are trying to find their North Star? Well, I think that, um, first of all, I've been very fortunate. And I think in a way I was at the right place at the right time to be at Stanford when um, the whole personal computer revolution was starting. Mm -hmm. And so I got sucked into it. And I think particularly as an English major and as a creative writing major, so a person who was not technical, but I had a passion for what the technology did for me to, you know, it's hard to remember this, but in the Stone Ages, to go back to when you were using a typewriter and whiteout to write things, to suddenly have the fluidity of a word processor was really kind of a life-changing experience. And when I was in, uh, when I went to Stanford Business School, I was there 1981 to 1983, I was one of only three people in the school who had my own personal computer. So... That was, wow. you know, when you think about that, it made me very popular for study groups. But, uh, <laughs> so I think for me, it was following a passion. And mm -hmm. I would definitely say that that is something that I think defines so many of, of entrepreneurs and so many successful entrepreneurs is the idea that if you can be passionate about something, if you can, and sometimes people say, well, how do I even know if I'm passionate? And I say, I find there's a really easy way to know if you're passionate about something. If you wake up in the middle of the night and you think about it, if you get to Monday morning and you're happy because it's time to go to work again, well, not that you don't work all weekend, you work all weekend too. <laughs> and if you find that time moves very quickly when you're doing something, you're probably passionate about it. And so I think if you can find something that you find the hours move by and you're really excited about it and you're always thinking of new ways to do it, you have passion. And if you follow your passion, whether that is as a startup or whether that's working for a larger company, you will ultimately, I think, do better and have a happier life. And, and that's the other thing I would say is, is so many people, and myself certainly this was the case, so, much of, so many of my waking hours are spent working that it's a lot more fun to work on something you're passionate about with people you love to work with. And if you do those two things, find people you love to work with and work on something you're passionate about, even if it fails, I think it will have been a good use of your time. Awesome. And um, even, I guess, when you're working on something that you're passionate about, things will get tough at some points. And so, Absolutely. you know, when things get really stressed, what, what do you do to get centered? Do you, you know, find comfort in something or do you find clarity by walking up a mountain? Do you do something way out of well, the way? Well, I think it's changed over time. I think mm -hmm. when I was in my 20s and, uh, you know, I was 100% I was focused on my work. And I think that the way that I found uh, my way through difficult times is I had great partners. I had a great team of people that mm -hmm. I was working with. And they're the mm -hmm. kind of people that, you know, when you're splattered on the pavement, they come and pick you up and keep <laughs> you going. And you do yeah. the same thing for them. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why so many entrepreneurial startups, when you really scratch the surface, there are a couple people, maybe two, maybe three. Yeah. Because it's really hard for one person to get through those bumps alone. 
And also sometimes if, if, it, if you're only seeing everything from your own perspective, it's very hard to see another perspective, yeah. which is why I think it's really important to surround yourself with, um, with good advisors and good mentors and, and to find other people, whether they are people that went to school with you who are running other things or whether they're uh, trusted friends. They don't all have to be, you know, professional industry people. They're just mm-hmm. people who, who know you and, and have a brain and can kind of help you get through things. So I do think that's important now. Um, and, and I think particularly for women, it's important to remember that, uh, you know, I mean, some of the most important things in my life right now are my children. And uh, at some point, if you want to have children, you have to actually have children. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I didn't have them until I was in my 30s. And so um, I, I think that having some balance in your life, having personal friends, making sure that you pay attention to your friends and your family. Mm-hmm. And and I will also tell you, as you get older, making sure you pay attention to your personal health uh, and take care of yourself because this is the one body you get to go around in this lifetime. And yeah. if you're not taking care of it, it's not going to last as long. It's just kind of good maintenance, mm-hmm. but that's hard for people to do. And when you're young, it's kind of easy to skip it and it doesn't really matter. But the older you get, the more it's sort of, you can't just power through it. Yeah. So now I do find it is important to take some time off. I, I do a lot of walking. Mm-hmm. Um, I spend time with my kids. I spend time with my family. I try to step away from the computer, you know, and step away from and turn off my iPhone and my iPad and, and, and go off the grid for a while. And that's really hard to do, but I think it's really, really critical to do. That's great. That's great. And so you mentioned, you know, sometimes you're working in a team with uh, people that you respect and work really well with. I had a question about mm-hmm. teams. Um, how do you get people pumped or motivated about something? And on the flip side, um, how do you get people through a tough spell? Well, I think, I mean, actually, I think it's, uh, the answer is very much the same. If you believe in what you're mm-hmm. doing and you can really explain why what you're doing is going to, and, you know, people use the expression change the world, you know, is creating a word processor really changing the world? Well, it is if you're a creative writing major, yeah. right? <laughs> is writing music about losing weight changing the world? Well, it is to those people you help who, have that as a central part of their lives. You know, there are, there are for every product, there is somebody who got passionate about it. You know, this always amazes me in like Unix middleware, like who on earth gets excited about that? But somebody gets excited about that. So I think that (laughs) finding like-minded people, a lot of it is who you attract and how you attract and what vision are you painting? And then I think it's treating people with respect, Mm -hmm. valuing their opinions, valuing their um, judgment, and and giving them room to be contributors that really motivates people you know when you're constantly micromanaging and when you're telling people what to do and when you're not being clear about what the vision is and i think also when you have questionable ethics mm-hmm. now you know there are companies that are successful where one could question the ethics i always believed it was really important to have an ethical compass and to not ever do things that compromise my ethics and not ever ask any of the people I worked with to compromise Mm -hmm. their ethics. And I think that that is really, really important because every company faces difficult times. And when you have a a ethical base that says it's okay to cut corners or it's okay to screw people Mm -hmm. over or whatever, you know, that's to me that I, I wouldn't want to live that way. And even if that makes your business more successful, it makes your life less successful. So I think it's very important to understand that. I think it's very important to communicate that and to constantly be testing too and making sure that that if someone's not understanding you or if somebody's not a good fit, that's the other thing I think for a lot of particularly early entrepreneurs, they hire people, but it's very hard for them to fire people, you know, to say this isn't yeah. working. Um, I think that's one of the greatest favors you can do someone when it, when they're in a situation where they can't be successful because there's not mm-hmm. a good fit if you set them free, they will go find a better situation. But yet that's a, that's a really hard thing to do. And it's awkward. And a lot of times their, their personal relationships and their emotions involved. And the, the, I know this sounds sort of cruel, but it's really not the less emotional you can be Mm -hmm. about it. I think the better Mm -hmm. off it it is for the team that you do um, uh, expect to have uh, be there. That's great. Um, Do you have an example of a particular time with TeamMaker? When either there was an ethical dilemma or you had to let someone go and it well, was for the best. I can, I can tell you an example of an ethical, you know, it, it's going to sound like a really silly one, 
but it's not silly, and, and I'll explain why I think it's not silly. We had um, a, it wasn't a fire, but it was a false alarm, and it set off the sprinklers in one of our storage facilities. And it had all of our, our um, masters for our documentation. But we weren't, gonna re we weren't gonna reprint that documentation, right? But right. technically the masters were insured for $25,000. And we were a startup and $25,000 was a meaningful amount of money. So we could have conceivably filed a claim and said we lost $25,000 worth of stuff. Mm -hmm. But we sort of knew at that point it was, just, it was just some paper and it wasn't really right. worth $25,000 to us anymore. And we made the decision not to file the claim. Now, why is that important? Well, what you don't realize is when you're a startup, you're a, you're a fishbowl and everybody sees and knows everything. And, and it's sort of like, you know, if you steal the postage, other people will steal the postage. And if you cheat on your taxes and you, you people think you think it's okay to cheat on taxes, they're going to cheat too. And I'm not saying that everybody's going to cheat, but, I, but you get what I'm saying. If you set up a culture in yeah. which cheating is okay, then how do people know where to draw the line? But when mm -hmm. you say cheating is not okay and filing a claim would be not okay, even though we could have filed the claim, um, I think you set a culture that then people have guidelines and they know how to follow. It's, it's a lot like being a parent. You know, they tell you when you have to be a parent, you have to be really consistent. You can't, yeah. you know, always have the yeah. same consistent North Star. And so I think that that is a really helpful thing. I think it's good for companies and I think it helps keep people keep focused. I think the other thing is when the going gets tough, when you face something difficult, and we had a time one time at TeamMaker where our word processor right now was late and we really mm -hmm. needed to do a lot more beta testing than we were able to do. And, and everyone stayed all the time, basically. And I felt, you know, just because I was a CEO, that didn't mean that I was above everyone else and I didn't have to stay. So I stayed all the time, too. And in fact, mm -hmm. every night around seven, I would order in pizza and I'd get pizza and Coke and, and Coca-Cola, not the other kind of Coke, and, uh, and <laughs> wine and beer, right? And I had a cart. I literally had a cart. You know, we had, I don't know, we probably had about 60 people at this time. So we weren't that big a company, but we weren't that small a company. Mm -hmm. And I would roll the cart around and serve everybody their dinner who was staying there to, to test, to, to, to beta test. And we also had, um, we had bug contests where we'd offer prizes for, for like, you know, and the problem was like, we'd offer a dollar for the first bug and then $2 for the next <laughs> bug and then $4 for the next bug and $8 for the next bug, up until we got to, you know, $128 or whatever the number was, the first num number over a hundred. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem with that is people got smart and they started holding holding back the bug, right? <laughs> so they could win the biggest prize, yeah. which was really pretty funny. Mm -hmm. But uh, but anyway, we, we tried to we tried to really, um, we, we didn't ever ask the employees to do things we weren't willing to do ourselves as the founders. And we rolled up our sleeves and we did the dirty work too. And I mean, you know, I think if you, if you ask people now, sort of one of the things they remember about being at TeamMaker, what I bet you some of them will say is, yeah, you'd come in at, at late at night and, and Heidi'd be in the kitchen loading the dishwasher, <laughs> right? You know, cause Hey, the dishwasher need to be loaded right. or the dishwasher need to be emptied. Somebody has got to do it. Yeah. And I think again, when you set that ethic, which is, Hey, I'm not too high and mighty, you know, I'll unload the dishwasher if that's what it takes or I'll, I'll, you know, bug test or I'll answer tech support lines, you know? And I think as a CEO and as a founder, you learn a lot doing all those things too. So it's not only do you learn, but you're also setting, um, setting the, the, the sort of the ethics of your company in a way that is much more powerful than telling people what to do, right? It's, it's doing it yourself, I think, yeah. makes all the difference in the world. That's awesome. I think it's really important that you created such a great company culture. Well, thank and, you. Uh, it was a wonderful so place. And, and I still, we still, we literally, we had a reunion a couple oh. of weeks ago where seven of us who worked together had a sleepover, all women, Aww. and we all got together <laughs> and we so had nice. a sleepover, and it was really fun. And I mean, we have a, we're, I sold that company in 1994. Wow. I mean, that's a long time ago, and we're still, we're all Best still friend. really close. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's really neat. It's really nice. Yeah. Um. Well, I have one last question yes. that I'm just really curious about. Um. What do you think differentiates a nine from a ten? So a nine is someone who's very <laughs> diligent, you know, 
goes to networking sessions, follows right. up with people, works really right. hard, and then a tennis and all-out rock star. Um, what do you think Boy. distinguishes two people like that? Like, I, I'm just really That's curious. That's a really hard think. answer. First of all, <laughs> there is room in the world for nines and tens, and people yes. can be tens on some things and nines on others and all of yeah. that. But I'll tell mm -hmm. you, here's an interesting example. Mm -hmm. uh, of, of what I would say is, so I just taught, uh, I actually taught at Stanford this quarter. I taught MSE 178 mm -hmm. and it was my first time being on the faculty and actually leading a whole quarter of a class. And so at the end of the quarter, sure enough, there is, you know, out of my 61 students, three of them got A pluses, right? So that yeah. meant they were pretty good, right? They were, they contributed and they did mm -hmm. all that stuff. Well, one of them got in touch with me after the grading was all done and said, I want to come meet with you and met with me and talked to me about his career and then asked me if it was okay if he asked me to forward something on LinkedIn for him. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, what are your rules of engagement for doing this kind of stuff? And I said, look, you know, you're, you graduate, you know, you, you were the top student in my class, one of the top in my class. So I'm happy to say to other people, Hey, this guy was one of the top students in my class and I don't mind you know, sending your resume to people because I think you'd be good. On the other hand, if you start asking me to do a ton of stuff for you, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to do it for you. And, and so what I would say, there is the case of he could have been a nine or he could have been a 9.8 or whatever, <laughs> but he made the extra effort, right, to mm -hmm. come and understand me, not waste my time, um, but ask me for a favor and do it in a way that was acceptable to me, right? Which is, which is something as simple as learning my format, right? I said, Hey, I'm yeah. an email person. And if you're going to mm -hmm. ask me to connect you with someone on LinkedIn, do it through LinkedIn. Cause that's easier than sending me an email and me having to go find that person and do all that kind of stuff. Right. So right. he understood that and he was persistent, but in a really nice way and tried to understand the boundaries. Mm -hmm. and and make it a win-win right mm -hmm. and to me that's that to me is when someone can figure out like how to ask you to do something for them that also benefits you that's that's a really great thing yeah that's Those an awesome example <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome um and so it's we've come to the end of the interview and uh um i'm just really grateful that you took the time to talk it's been incredible talking to you sure. about well, well you know. good luck at school you're at one of my favorite places in the world <laughs> and it was you asked great questions so thank you thank you so much uh, it was really great talking to you okay all right bye bye